Hello, and welcome back. Um, this is lecture 14 for Computational Neuroscience Systems 552 Biology 487, taught at the University of Waterloo, winter 2021. And the topic for this week is the Neural Engineering Framework. Um, right, what is this? So, a little bit of context for this in a course in Computational Neuroscience. Um, everything else in this course has been computational neuroscience, the sort of things that should be covered in any computational neuroscience course anywhere on the planet. Um, and what the topic for this week is more like computational neuroscience as done at the University of Waterloo. So there's a particular technique that was developed here at the University of Waterloo um, by uh, Professor uh, Chris Eliasmith. Um, and um, we're sort of the, the core heart of where that research is going on. There's starting to be other people that use this technique um, at other institutions, but it's um, more sort of, sort of one-off sort of things. Um, we're sort of the only community, or the, yeah, the only group that is really using it on a regular basis. Um, but it is starting to be sort of accepted as part of the computational neuroscience community. So I think it's worth talking about. Um, Plus, it's sort of the reason that I moved to Waterloo and started joining this particular lab, and I'm working where I am, um, was because of this particular technique. So this is what I use the vast majority of time um, in my own research. Um, all right. Um, what is it? Um, so first of all, it's an attempt to kind of connect everything that we've done in the course so far. Um, so you're going to get bits and pieces of things that you've, so we've sort of seen throughout the course um, at pretty much every level. Um, and that makes it kind of tricky to get a handle on, um, but we'll work through it. I think we've got the right background for it. Um, there are two books that lay out um, the details of this. The Neural Engineering book on the left was published in 2003. That was the one that um, really sort of laid the groundwork for all of this. Um, and then How to Build a Brain sort of came out uh, 2013. Um, that's more sort of a, a little bit more accessible sort of update, but okay, here's the basics and where you can go with it. So the one on the left gives all of the theoretical foundations of everything. The one on the right is more of a, all right, let's, you know, here's a quick intro to the, the, the foundations and now what do we build from it? Um, so there are those resources and tons of papers, but those are the places to, to go. But the goal is I want to build whole systems out of neurons um, because that's what brains do. Um, with a lot of people, how people use neural networks in, say, industry, you're like, oh, I make a thing that recognizes images or that uh, translates text or something like that. Um, when you actually use such a neural network, you normally put a bunch of other code around it to actually make it as part of a larger system. So, you know, um, you know a self-driving car does not just use a neural network. It uses a couple of neural networks as different parts of it, and then lots of other things that are all connecting it together, um, or use lots of other different, different techniques. Um, and so one way to phrase this, this whole goal of this project is, well, look, brains, all you got is neurons. Um, how are we using neurons to do tons of all the rest of this stuff? I mean, I think everyone's pretty happy that you can use neurons to recognize faces um, or, or you know, uh, read text or something like that. Um, how, do you, how do you interpret text? How do you program? How do you, how do you connect these networks together would be another way of phrasing that. Um, um, and one sort of something along that lines is say, yeah, how do you program with neurons? So like when we're building up larger systems, we're used as programmers, we're sort of used to like, well, you, you have if statements and for loops and things like that. Um, and so one way to think about what's happening is that um, in programming, you not only just have functions, you also have like control flow sorts of things like if statements and for loops and things like that. Um, and everything we've talked about so far with the neural networks looks an awful lot maybe like a function, but we still need to know how to connect these things together. Um, and are if statements and for loops are the right way to think about things, or is there some other better way to think about things? Um, uh, spoiler, it's going to turn out that if turn out that if statements and for loops are the wrong way of thinking about things, and we're going to be coming up with a, a right way to think about things in terms of neurons. So that's one big aspect is we want to build whole systems out of neurons. The other really big aspect um, is 
I want to be able to adjust the level of detail. I don't want to be forced to think about things only at one level of abstraction. Um, when I'm talking about uh, neurons, there's so much detail there. Um, I mean, yeah, I can't pay attention to all the detail all the time, but I want to make sure that my technique is not locking me into one particular level of detail. So for instance, if you're doing backprop, it's really difficult you know, if, you're build, if you're building neural networks with, with backpropagation algorithms, it's really, really difficult to deal with spiking neurons um, or to deal with low-level, um, uh, you know, any sort of weird membrane effects or postsynaptic currents or things like that. Um, I want instead a technique that is a little bit more general that, and that lets me adjust the level of detail. Sometimes I want spiking neurons, sometimes I don't want spiking neurons. Um, it's really going to be something where I want to add detail as needed. And normally what that add needed means is um, whatever comparison I'm trying to make between the model and the real system, um, you know, what what detail do I need there? So if I'm, if I'm looking at a real system and I've got spike data coming out of an actual brain and I want to compare my model to that, cool, then I should have spikes in my model. Um, if all I'm getting at, if, if I'm not recording spikes from the real biological system, instead I'm just looking at behavior, cool, then Maybe I don't need spiking neurons. Um, and in particular, what I would really like to do is be able to say, hey, look, let's do the same thing with spiking, without spiking. What's the difference? Um, uh, what do I lose by not adding in that sort of detail? In order to do that sort of thing, I've got to make sure that my system um, can work with whatever level of detail I want. All right, so that's the overall goal. That's what Chris laid out um, in that book there on the bottom right. Um, and that's sort of what we're going to cover in this core initial lecture. All right, so how are we gonna do this? Here's the core component that we're gonna make use of, and it's gonna look pretty similar to what we've been doing in this course so far. All right, um, I've got some input, x. I've got some output, y. Um, x might be, say, a three-dimensional vector. I've got three values as my input, two values as my output. Got some input. I've got some connection weights. I've got some neurons. Um, I've got some other connection weights. I've got some outputs. Okay. This pic. This is a picture that you have seen many, many, many times in the course. So it's like, all right, this is. This seems like a pretty good place to start, um, and it seems to be applicable to regardless of level of abstraction. So these these things here could be spiking neurons. They'd be non-spiking neurons. Be whatever you want. One weird thing that I'm doing here, though. Um, is I've got this group here marked in blue, and they're sort of going to be my neurons. These components here, which in a, like in a, in a normal sort of deep neural network or backpropagation neural network, these things, the input and the output, would also be neurons. For now, I'm just going to say, all right, let's pretend these things are nothing. There's not even a nonlinearity here. So... Um, uh, it's not a rectified linear unit. It's not. It's it's. It is just literally nothing. It's just whatever the input is. Take the input, multiply it by the weights. That's going to be fed into the neurons. Okay. Um, that doesn't really change much. Of the, you know, it's kind of a weird thing to do, um, but it doesn't really change much in terms of what neural networks can do. I mean, the idea that a neural network can be trained up to do anything um, still applies in this sort of situation. Um, and indeed, that's sort of what we want to think of. Of going uh, that's going on here is as you change these connection weights, and I guess as you change the properties of these neurons, you're changing what the mapping is between x and y. Right? You're chain, and one way to think about that is you are just changing what function this neural network is doing. Right? And this is the standard idea that a neural network is, can be thought of as a function approximator. Right? It's um, as we adjust those weights, we're going to, and there's lots and lots of different ways of setting those weights. Um, whatever you want to use you're still going to have something that is taking in an input and is producing an output. And so you can think of that as a function. We have a function approximator here. Okay. All right. So that's going to be our core component. Um, fine. That seems okay. What are we going to do with that? Um, uh, okay. Before we go, we're going to do that terminology. Um, I'm going to be calling these things here. So this is just a set of connection weights. Um, we're going to call that the encoder. So we're 
Um, the set of connection weights is going to be called E for the encoder. This set of connection weights is being called D for the decoder. Um, that's going to come up. Um, but our idea is um, that the way we're thinking about it is this X value is being encoded into the neural activity, and then we're decoding out something that gives us um, our, our output value Y. Think, think of it that way. It doesn't matter. It's just two sets of connection weights. Uh, but it'll be useful to have that distinction as we go on. All right, there's our core component. We can do any technique we want to feel with END. We can do backprop if your neuron model supports backprop. Um, you could randomly generate E. Um, so if, if we wanted to be really, really ge um, general here and have this work for anything, um, the approach of randomly generating E, right? And that would be the same as randomly generating the features all the way back when we talked about perceptrons. Um, we're, we're randomly generating these sets of weights feeding into some neuron model. Those are giving us some sort of features. Um, and then if we want to, we can do again, the same thing we did with the perceptron is, um, or same thing we could have done when we were back when we were talking about the perceptron is, hey, these output weights, um, let's just go ahead and use regression. Let's just solve for those connection weights. Or you could use some sort of learning algorithm. Right. Whatever approach you want, I don't care. We can do that with this sort of model. One nice thing about setting the um, encoding weights randomly um, is you can play around with, if, if there's particular biological data you're trying to compare to, you can play around with what distributions you choose to generate these weights um, such that you can get um, whatever sort of biological properties you want out of these neurons. Right. That's kind of neat because that's sometimes data that neuroscientists have access to, is they might have recordings from particular parts of the brain as they vary the input to that, you know, some input signal um, and see what causes those neurons to fire. Um, sort of an extreme example of this is that would be exactly what was happening with, say, um, the neurons in V1 that are detecting uh, lines at particular angles, right? This input could be an image we could generate these connection weights such that this particular neuron was sensitive to a line at a particular angle at a particular point in the visual space. Um, and that would give us a neuron that is picking out that particular feature. Um, so it becomes pretty easy to do the approach of generate this weight, these sets of weights um, to match whatever sort of biological data that you sort of, you, that you have. Um, so that's going to be the default approach uh, in everything that I'm going to talk about today. Um, that we're just going to randomly generate these um, and then solve for the decoders. And we're randomly generating our encoders, solving for the decoders. Or randomly generating the first layer of weights, solving for the second layer of weights. Um, but that's not a restriction, that's just a default approach to use. Fine. So far, it's just, yeah, you can use a neural network to approximate functions, um, and we're just pointing out that. You can simplify things a bit by getting rid of these nonlinearities, and you can use any neuron model you want in here. Fine, it's still just using neural networks, a function approximator. What are you going to do with that? Um, well, the first thing we can do with that um, is we can actually start talking about well, what functions would such a neural network be good at? Um, there is a um, there's certainly the general principle with neural networks um, that certainly if you make this middle layer large enough and you have enough features, then sure, you can approximate any function you want. That's exactly, again, what the perceptron people were talking about way back at the beginning of the course. Um, um, but in this particular case, um, you know, if we've got a particular neuron model, we've got encoders, and, and we're randomly generating these encoders, um, um, there's actually a couple things that we can we can end up saying here. Um, for the particular simplest case, or a relatively common case, um, this is with leaky integrate and fire neurons, um, and I'm randomly generating the encoders. Um, so this, all right, what am I what am I plotting here? I've got one input for this one particular case, just my input across x. So I've just got one arrow coming in here, um, and what I'm plotting here is each of these lines is a different neuron. Uh, and each neuron has a different uh, connection weights to that value. Of course, it's going to have both a connection weight and that bias input. That again, uh, so, so every every neuron both has a strength of connection from that input um, and a bias uh, 
um, value. Um, and that's going to move, move each neuron, each neuron's um, response curve uh, on this plot. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, as you vary the input, if you hold the input constant at some particular value, you can observe some firing rate from this neuron. Right. And so we might have a neuron, so hey, this blue neuron up here, um, uh, if you give it an input of minus one, then it doesn't fire at all, but any value above minus one, it starts firing and firing faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And faster. Um, but then another neuron um, might go this way, and another neuron might go this way, and or start firing at a different point. Um, these sorts of tuning curves are, uh, this, so this particular thing is, is meant to be um, uh, a relatively okay match to um, particular biological neurons. Um, in that these sorts of things where, hey, look, I have neurons res that respond to positive numbers, some neurons respond more to negative numbers, and there's a big mess in between. It's a reasonably common thing to find in real biological um, neuron uh, brains. Uh, these are called on neurons and off neurons. Um, so that's that's all, you know, a relatively common, and this this is sort of the default sort of random randomly generated uh, values here. Um, that we'll be using. All of that said, you can generate, given once you've generated, you've chosen some particular distribution of encoders and some particular neuron model, um, you can generate plots like this. And then what you can do is you can say, well, if these are the features that I have, each of these lines is a different feature, right? It's a different thing that is mapping an input to some sort of activity of a particular neuron. And if our output is the weighted sum of these features, then we should be able to say something, well, what functions can be made from the weight of some of these features? And that turns out to be a well-formed mathematical question. Um, that is what singular value decomposition was invented for. Well, anyway, one of the things singular value decomposition does. Um, one way to think of that, uh, I don't know if this is useful, but one way to think of that is each of these neurons is um, forming an overcomplete basis space. And then we're trying to figure out what that basis space is good for. Um, but the idea is you just take this value and then do singular value decomposition on it. Um, sometimes um, similarly, you can also call this principal components analysis. Um, one thing that this does is it says, well, hey, look, if I was just going to do weighted sums of these things and produce some output, what sorts of outputs would I be good at doing? Um, and it turns out that the answer is, well, the best output, the thing that you would be best at, so these are the first few singular um, uh, the vectors come uh, corresponding to the first few singular values. Um, uh, and in and what this is saying is what sorts of functions this overall system would be good at approximating um, in order of difficulty. And so the easiest one is this blue line. And the blue line is just sort of, well, whatever the input is, uh, just produce an output that's pretty much the same value, no matter what that input is. Uh, we'll also be good at doing scaled versions of these functions. Um, because if you want to do a scaled version of this, you just multiply all your weights by some scaling value. Um, so the easiest function for this whole system to approximate is the function y equals 1, or y equals minus 1, or y equals 0.5, whatever, that whole family of functions. Um, so, all right, fine. A neural network that no matter what the input is produces the same output, fine. That seems an okay thing to want. Um, seems kind of useless, but it's there. Um, but the next easiest thing is the function y equals x. Um, that's this green line here, although I guess in this plot it's y equals minus x. Um, again, uh, any scaling factor up front doesn't matter, doesn't change the difficulty. Uh, but that's the next thing these neurons are good at approximating is just y equals x. The thing after that is this red line. All right, that's y equals x squared. All right, it's pretty good at being computing x squared. Next one, yeah, it's x cubed, and so on and so forth. Um, they're not quite the polynomials. It actually turns out to be closer to the Legendre polynomials, which are just sort of sim similar to the basic polynomials. Um, but what this is saying is um, the functions that this one sort of group of networks would be good at computing are smooth functions, functions that are well approximated by low-degree polynomials, or... Um, what else we, how else could I phrase that? Um, functions where a small change in the input is a, causes a small change in the output. Um, 
the um, and certainly if I add enough neurons I can approximate any function I want um, but this is going to be the class of functions that this particular group of neurons um, and lots of other neuron models um, so this 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 result turns out to be pretty robust in terms of there's a wide variety of neuron models that you could put here um, and a wide variety of distributions of tuning curves that you could put here or distributions of connection weights um, that would cause pretty similar results here so that's the one that's the one thing that we want to keep in mind is when we're breaking these things down into components if my component is meant to be approximated by one little thing like this um, then it should be a relatively smooth function So what can I do with that? Well, let's start building stuff up. If that's what I've got, so this is the same graph I've shown before, just with fewer lines for simplicity. Um, some input goes to a group of neurons, produces some output. If I want to build up a larger system out of that, well, I just connect them up. All right, so I could just, all right, I could build this as one neural network. I could build this as another neural network and I can connect them up. And that's sort of obvious. Of course, you can just take the output from one neural network and feed it into the another neural network. That's, that's not an interesting advance. Why am I even pointing this out? Well, there's a cool thing we can do here. Um, because as an engineer, fine, this sort of makes sense that I can just take my system. Here's X, here's Y, you know, here's one neural network. Take the output, feed it into the next network output. Okay. Um, but the biologist looks at this and goes, hold on a second. Something is wrong here. Because if this, if this is meant to be some sort of computational neuroscience model as well, there's nothing like this happening in the brain. I don't have a group of neurons that then connect to some component that does nothing that then compounds, connects out to some other component. That just doesn't exist. But hold on a second. If this component does nothing, it doesn't correspond to anything in a biological system, let's just get rid of it. And again, let me just highlight what's happening there, right? There was just a set of connection weights here. This did nothing. And then a set of connection weights here. If we just multiply this set of connection weights by this set of connection weights, we get a set of connection weights that goes from this group of neurons to this group of neurons. And there isn't even any approximation happening here. That's just, that's actually equal. Like, we're not losing anything by getting rid of this component in the middle. This is just a wildly weird new way of generating a set of connection weights. I'm setting connection weights from here to here, but what I've done is I've done it as two different components. I built this neural network by randomly generating this neural network and solving for this set of weights. And then I built this neural network by randomly generating this set of weights and solving for this set of weights. But then when I connect them together, if I want to make sure this system here corresponds to something in biology, then I just multiply these two things together, one of which I randomly generated and one of which I solved for using regression, or I could have used backprop across, or I could have done backprop over here and then done backprop over here and then combined these, and do whatever I want. Um, I just multiply them together and I get the connection weights that does the same thing. And so that gives an interesting technique of sort of okay, that means that I can go ahead and build up much more complicated things. I can take a large problem, break it down into individual components, turn those components into different functions, um, and just specify, okay, I need, this is a value here, I need to compute some value on it here, put it here, this x is going to be the sum of this input and that input, that'll go in there. Now, this starts looking a little bit more like programming. I mean, weird programming, right? But, um, that's the sort of idea that we're going for. Let's take one small detour here now and talk about, well, there's some biological details that we, that we can sort of add into this system. And there's one particular biological detail that's going to be kind of interesting to add in. Um, I mean, everything I just said, you can put in really complicated neuron models if you feel like it. That doesn't really change anything of the story. Synapses are going to turn out to say something slightly more complicated about this story. Because when I actually connect from a group of neurons to another group of neurons in biology, most of the time, when one of these neurons spikes, I'm actually getting some sort of postsynaptic current that is caused by one spike that goes into this group of neurons. Right. Um, and if I wanted to add in that detail here, right, if I've got a big set of connection weights here, going from A to B, 
um, I would sort of have one of these spikes happening. So for every single one of these neurons over here in A, whenever it spiked, it would produce this sort of signal like that. And all of those things would be all added up and that would give us our total input going into B. Um, one way I could, so if, I've got to have, if I'm going to apply that on each of the spikes, um, and I generated that big giant weight matrix by just multiplying two other, the decoder and the encoder together, well, I could say exactly the same thing this way. I could say, okay, well, each of these, these neurons here, they're, they're spiking. I'm just going to multiply by that decoder to produce Y, but each of these neurons is going to, you know, whenever, whenever these neurons spike, it produces something like this. All of those results are going to get added together. That's going to produce Y. Then we're going to multiply by the encoders to feed it into B. Right. And that should be exactly identical to this because I haven't changed anything. I'm just all right, but that still doesn't really say. Well, how, how is that going to affect Y? Like, I can't. You know, what sort of intuition should I have about how Y is going to change because I've added in this biological detail? Well, hold on a second. Most of these sorts of postsynaptic current neuron models are pretty linear. And so that means I can move this component from here to here. All right. If, if the only thing that's happening is whenever a spike is happening, I'm putting down this sort of pattern. Um, mathematically, that's the same as convolving the spike train with some function, h of t, which is this shape. Um, and if the only thing that's happening is adding up all those values, all right, then that's safe. It's safe. I'm, I'm just sort of rearranging brackets. It's safe for me to take a linear operation from this part and move it here. So that means what I could instead do is just take all those spikes, do the weighted sum to produce Y, and then apply the synapse. And that's mathematically identical to applying the synapse model first. Okay. And so that's going to mean, well, now I can actually say what's the hex that I was that going to affect Y. So if Y now is just the raw weighted output, the value I'm going to get over here is the raw weighted output, and then mathematically, that is the convolution of this with this. Um, if I have, you know, depending on my neuron model, that's going to have different, or depending on my synapse model, that's going to have different effects. Um, and again, some people, depending on what courses you've taken, you, you may have done this sort of convolution before. Um, in, uh, in practice, the sort of the way, if you haven't taken such a course, the sort of the safe way of thinking about what's happening here um, is this is just going to sort of act to smooth this data over time a little bit. Right? It's sort of um, the another term for this is, this is a low pass filter. Um, I've got some sort of data coming out of the system um, and we're just going to smooth it over time a little bit. Okay. And that's going to be producing the input going to the next one. So this is sort of a situation where adding a low-level biological detail is actually changing the function that is being computed. Because now no longer is the system computing, you know, I've trained up this network to, you know, y is some function of x. Well, the output that I'm actually getting is y is some function of x eh, with this little smoothing filter added on top. Okay. So... That's what we get now whenever we sort of, you know, okay, so, all right, so this is a more complex programming task now. Now, you know, whenever I build these sorts of groups of neurons, now I can also say, well, these values that I'm sort of passing around here, maybe I want to smooth them out a little bit, or maybe I want to filter them in different ways. Um, uh, Low-pass filters um, is, you know, or at least a, the different neurotransmitters are going to sort of have different time constants and can have different smoothing properties. So you can now play with that by adjusting the neurotransmitter that's being used. You're getting a different um, uh, filter operation also being applied on these connections. All right, that's starting to get a little bit weirder. Um, or what can we do with that? Um, for the most part, that when, whenever I'm working with things in terms of these sorts of, you know, what neurotransmitter should I use? Do I want a little bit of smoothing? I generally do think of it just that way. It's just sort of, eh, this data here, you know, do I really care about what the value is this millisecond? Or should I like, yeah, I'm, yeah maybe this input should be, well, um, what's the value I'm seeing over the last 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds or something like that? And so that can let me um, smooth my data over some sort of window. Um, that's normally how I think of it. With one, it's important exception. And that important exception is 
recurrent networks. Now, again, if I go back here, you will notice there's something kind of weird about this diagram that I've shown and that there is no connections backwards or back to themselves. And that's something that in brains, we very often see connections coming back. Right. So what happens? Well, let's go ahead and figure out what is going to happen with the simplest sort of recurrent networks setup. Okay. Um, I am going to do warn people a little bit. We're about to hit a really weird set of math. Um, and for the majority of, well, yeah, for the majority of people, the math is just going to be something where like, okay, I'm just going to show you a wall of math and you'll just ignore it and, and just take, there's a punchline at the end and then, and we'll just accept the punchline and we'll just stick with that. Um, I, I do think it's at least, it's, um, I think it's at least interesting to show the math. Um, if the math means nothing to you, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but I'm just going to at least show it. Um, all right. So we want to understand recurrent networks. I've already shown this feed forward sy system the same way before. So we're feeding an X into some group of neurons. We're getting out some function of X. So that's what this network was trained up to do. I'm then applying some sort of synapse. And I've just argued that it's safe to think about that synapse as being applied here, even though biologically it's being applied here. But biologically, these two things don't exist anyway. The, all of this is getting multiplied together into one giant set of connection weights. Um, and it's all mathematically exactly the same as splitting it up. So it's safe for us to think about this filter as being, apl being applied here. All right. um, that gives us our Y. And then Y is maybe going into another group of neurons, which is getting us a new function. Um, and then the way we, we can think of this now is that this function here, the thing that this group of neurons is feeding into this group of neurons, um, is, well, whatever function was being computed here convolved with this filter function. Okay? Um, or whatever this output is um, smoothed by this filter. Um, Mathematically, the way that can be written is y of t. Um, so h of t is this sort of weird, sh whatever the shape is of our postsynaptic current that we're using. Or, so that depends on our synapse model. Um, and then this star thing, that's the convolution operation. So we're going to convolve this with that, and that'll get us y of t. That's just the math way of saying what I've been saying. So what happens when we add in a recurrent connection? So I'm adding in a recurrent connection from here back into here. Um, that's where I'm adding it in, in this diagram. Again, if we do the same sort of thing that, hey, this whole set of green arrows is actually just going to turn into connection weights from A to B, and each of those connections is going to have a synapse. Right? Equivalently, this recurrent connection here all right, is just going to be recurrent connections from B back to itself with a synapse. Okay? But we're going to draw it this way so that we have a hope of following the math. So if I draw it this way, and I write out the math, it turns out to this thing here at the bottom. So y of t is some filtered version of the first function pl plus the second function. And now if I wanted to say, okay, so what the heck is actually going to happen here? How is y actually going to change given this situation? Just looking at this, I, math, I have no intuition whatsoever about what the heck is going to happen here. This is the part where I go and find whatever my nearby mathematician is um, and ask that, or someone who has recently taken some sort of um, um, signals and systems course or calculus course or something that says, all right, how the hell do I deal with this? Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, okay, that's a very interesting puzzle you have there. Um, so, um, but they're going to point out that basically the techniques that you learn in a, uh, sort of a first course in this stuff is sufficient to solve it. Um, so that's the math. Um, and then sort of lesson number one of convolution is convolution is a horrible operation. You want to get rid of it. There's a bunch of different things that mathematicians know for getting rid of it. Um, one of them that people might be familiar with is the Fourier transform. Another one that people might be familiar with is the Laplace transform. And the Laplace transform um, just sort of says, um, basically both of those things are going to turn this star this convolution into multiplication there's some transformation that is turning this into this 
OK. Basically, it just changes our T variable into an S variable, and you change lowercase letters into uppercase letters. But one cool thing is that that particular function, so oops, let me draw it. So this particular function, which is often approximated as a um, as an exponential curve, so uh, e to the minus t over tau, that particular function is one that has a nice, well-behaved Laplace transform. So, um, and it's one of the ones that's just in the back of the textbook. So it turns out that the value there is one over one plus s tau where tau is the time constant of that low path of that uh, postsynaptic current. Once you do that transformation, you do a little bit, a little bit of just algebra just to reorganize it. Um, you get this thing over here on the left. And the reason you, you want that over on the left is when you do the inverse Laplace transform, you get this thing over here. Um, what is that saying? So that's telling us how Y will change. So if, if, if we if we set up two networks, if we train up one network to approximate f of x, and we train up another network to approximate g of y, and then we connect them up in this weird recurrent way where the g is actually being used to make a recurrent connection back to itself, then this is telling us how y will change over time, assuming our networks are good at approximating those functions. Uh, it's telling me no, uh, so dy dt will be this. As a sort of a side effect of that, if I have a particular differential equation that I really want, then what I do is I train up one neural network that computes this function and another neural network that computes this function. And again, I can use any technique I feel like for doing that. I can use backprop, I can use the regression approach, whatever technique I feel like. I build those two networks separately as feed forward normal neural networks, and then I just wire them up in a weird way, and I will get something that will approximate this particular differential equation. That's weird. Um, first, again, if the math doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it at all. The punchline is, here is, if I have a particular differential equation I want, I can just build these other networks and wire them up in a weird way. Okay. Strange. Um, this is an extremely weird way of generating neural networks. Um, turns out to be um, a pretty useful thing to do. So, um, let's try some examples of that. Um, the simplest differential equation that might be useful um, is to compute the integral. Um, so this is just dy dt equals x. This is saying if x is 0, then y is not, shouldn't change. If x is positive, y should increase. If x is negative, y should decrease. Okay. We can think of this as sort of a really minimal sort of memory system, because if y is at some value and x is 0, then y will just stay at that value. And this is telling us, oh, okay, all I have to do to, to build that is build up two neural networks, one that approximates this function, one that approximates this function, um, and it'll go ahead and work. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing here on the video on the on the right. Um, I'm just showing the input changing over time. This is the actual value of y that's changing over time. Um, and you can see it's doing exactly what I just described. Um, whenever my input is zero, it stays at whatever value it's at. When it's positive, it goes up. When it's negative, it goes down. And it goes down at sort of a nice linear sort of rate. Okay. This is a pretty tricky sort of system to build with other sorts of, uh, of neural network techniques. Um, this isn't something that is a particularly natural thing to be able to build using backprop um, or things like that. Um, so that's, um, this is sort of a, um, it's not necessarily a new class of things, um, but it's certainly a new way of generating this sort of net of uh, a neural network that does that has this sort of behavior, um, and it's applicable to any neuron model with whatever technique you want, as long as you're doing this weird sort of let's combine things together and use synapses approach. Um, slightly more complex example: we have oscillators. Um, so here is a neural network um, where uh, so these are three different neural networks. Um, so this is that even one where there is no input. The only thing there is is this recurrent connection, this, this first one that we're, we're showing up here. 
Um, if I go grab an engineering textbook and I say, okay, what's the equation for an oscillator? All right, it says that, and I just use what I described to go jet ahead and build a neural network that approximates that, and here's what I get. Um, and uh, so in these squares, each of those squares is an individual neuron. Um, I'm plotting y, and in this case, y is two-dimensional, um, and we get exactly what we're kind of hoping for. Um, uh, there's no external input. The network just goes ahead and goes through some oscillatory pattern. Um, you can be a little bit fancier, and you can even try to do something like a square wave oscillator, or a square oscillator. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can. Um, the more interesting one is this one at the bottom here, where we do have an input, but what that input does is control the speed of the oscillation. And that's just simply why, all right, well, this would be the equation for a controlled oscillator. It's just, all we've done is added an extra variable that sort of says, all right, this variable here is going to control how quickly um, these are changing. Um, here we're plotting what the speed is, what we're, we're, we're putting in a value to be whatever, uh, to indicate what the speed is into this group of neurons, recurrent connection, and again, this is what our group of neurons is representing here, and this is the neural activity. Um, and what we're seeing here is a system where if I set this group of neurons to zero, if I, if I set the input to zero, then these groups of neurons stop oscillating. And if I change the, that input, then they will oscillate either in one direction or the other direction. This is something that people had tried to build with neurons um, in lot, using lots of techniques um, and had been generally unsuccessful. Turns out to be really easy to build with this particular approach. Right? It's really not clear how would you, you would use backprop to build up a system like this. Um, but it turns out to be nice and easy with this weird constructive approach, this neural engineering approach. All right, so we're getting closer to being able to build up weird stuff. Um, and indeed, that's exactly what this neural engineering thing is doing, is saying, if I want to build up these larger systems, I can build a bunch of these blocks, define variables, define functions being computed, and define differential equations that I want to compute. I can go ahead and define all that, and then there's this very automated process of just, all right, well, just train up networks that do each of these components, connect them all together, and you should have an overall system that does what you want. All right, because um, you specify it at this level, and then it's a pretty simple process to just say, okay, well, we're going to have groups of neurons for each of those things. We're going to train up each of these individual little networks, right? And then we're going to take all those networks, and we're going to do that connection weight multiplying thing uh, to act if you actually want to just have connections just between the, the neurons. Right, and we get this. Um, and interestingly, the sort of means that all of those intermediate variables that we sort of specified and built, like the inputs and the outputs, those stick around, but these intermediate variables, they don't actually exist in the final model. Um, just because, you know, there aren't neurons for those particular individual values, they're sort of being represented somehow by all of these. By all this, by all the features that these neurons are extracting from that information. Cool. So um, that's the general approach of the neural engineering framework. Um, you express your model in terms of vectors, functions, and differential equations. Um, you choose particular neuron models that you want. You can even have different neuron models in different parts of the system. Some parts could have a lot of biological detail. Some could like not even be spiking. Um, you can do rectified linear units for part of the model, whatever you want to do. Um, depends on the task, depends on what sort of evaluations you want to do. Um, you then generate the model, and now you can go ahead and evaluate the performance of the system, sort of compare it to empirical data, whatever you want. Um, and then the interesting caveats in there is that the functions that you're trying to use here, both the functions and the differential equations, should be smooth. Um, and one way to think about that is... Um, if I ask such a system, so if I if I try to train up a network, say, to implement this function, right, where the input is, at, is here and the output is y, and so there's this place in the input where, like, a very small change in the input causes a huge change in the output. That's why I would say that this would be a very non-smooth function. Um, what the network will end up doing, if you have if you have a finite number of neurons or finite number of features being extracted to try to do this, 
you're going to end up with something more like this on the other side. So it won't per be a perfect approximation of the function that you've asked for. It'll instead be a function like this, um, which might be fine. You know, there's all sorts of sort of algorithms where I might define my high-level algorithm in, in terms of a really sh sharp function like this, but then it turns out that it might work fine if I have a smoother function. Um, or if I really want this sharp difference here, well, then I need to add more neurons or, you know, adjust neuron properties or something so that it will be um, really good at this sort of sharp distinction. Okay. It's a nice place where the low-level biological detail um, can interact with what the, the high-level behavior of the overall system is. So a small change in the biological detail might cause a big change in the behavior, um, which then can be a great basis for sort of testable predictions. Anyway, um, so that's sort of a thing to keep in mind when doing this approach. Um, the other thing that is just sort of really, really weird with this approach is, all right, this lets me build up pretty big systems, but it's not like normal programming in that I, I don't have for loops. I don't have like perfect if statements. Like this is the closest thing I get to an if statement, right? You know, if the value is less than zero, do one thing, other, another thing. I don't get a perfect if statement. <laughs> um, how am I going to program with these sorts of constraints? How am I going to build up large systems with that sort of approach? Um, it's tricky, um, and it's something that takes um, a, a while to learn to do. Um, to sort of support that process, we've been uh, we've developed some software um, that will help people uh, build that up. Um, I'll be demoing that software in the second video that I will post um, immediately after this one. Um, the idea is that you can basically define these high-level functions, define this data, have the system automatically take care of all those steps that I just described of train up the individual neural networks, combine them together, multiply weights together, make it all, add in those filters of those postsynaptic current filters, make all that happen. Um, it sort of just automates all that whole process. Uh, software is called Nango. Um, it's also got an, in a, a graphical user interface that you're sort of seeing there on the top right. I find that really useful for at least visualizing what the heck is going on. Um, it's also got some nice features um, because it's taking compare of that compiling process itself. It can do some nice things for compiling to different hardware that might have different neuron models. So for instance, if you have this neuromorphic hardware that is some particular weird neuron model on it, it's like, okay, I'll just take that into account when I'm you know, training up these networks and solving for these weights. Um, so then it can do a good job of mapping it onto whatever particular hardware you have. Um, and then, again, you don't have to worry about the particular details between, oh, the leaky integrate and fire neuron model on this hardware is different from this hardware, and so I need a different set of connection weights. Um, it'll go take care of all that. Um, there's also been a bit of work trying to um, add in more biological detail. Um, um, and it's worth pointing out that... Um, the group of us who initially developed the software, Nengo, um, did a, made a startup company called Applied Brain Research, um, which um, is sort of using this software. So one thing, they're developing the software and maintaining it and doing bug reports and, and, um, and all that sort of stuff. That helps, so it's sort of vaguely professionally, um, fairly professionally um, uh, uh, yeah, maintained. Um, but then the company itself is sort of applying Nango both to research questions um, and to industry applications. So because it can compile to networks to particular custom hardware, um, it makes it really nice for trying out different hardware, especially if you don't want to be committed to one particular sort of hardware. Um, this is um, pretty much the only tool that lets you take the same code and run it on different um, uh, neuromorphic hardware um, because it can customize the model for the different hardware. Um, yeah, uh, it's sort of, it's, uh, it's not fully open source. It is freely available for non-commercial usages and you get the full source code. It's just on GitHub and you can just pip install it. Um, uh, uh, but for commercial usages, the company wants to make money at some point, right? Um, anyway, so that's, um, that's the tool. Um, and I will be demoing that in the next video. Um, all right, where do we go from here? Um, so that, what I've just shown there is the core basis of the neural engineering framework. There's no other interesting things to add to that. Everything else is about scaling up. 
Um, and for me, for what scaling up tends to mean is, well, one thing is scaling up to larger and larger neural networks, which means you need more and more weird hardware. That's taken care of by the Nengo thing. Um, but the other aspect of scaling up is more complex systems. So fine, what I just showed before, you can sort of maybe see how you might be able to program some simple stuff. How, how do you build a neural network that does something like language or something like planning or, or reasoning? Um, that's a big part of my own personal research topic, so the sorts of things that I research. Um, and it all takes the, this form of taking those high-level tasks, language, planning, reasoning, whatever, and converting it into vectors, functions, and differential equations. Um, and that's the, that's the really fun puzzle, is reformulating all these things that people have done in traditional programming terms um, and reformulating into this very different way. Um, the general approaches that we've taken to do that um, is something called vector symbolic architectures. The idea of taking, um, if you have sort of language or a bunch of symbols um, and you want to turn that into vectors, well, the approach is each basic symbol is a vector and then you can combine symbols to make phrases or statements by performing math operations on those vectors. Um, and as long as those math operations are also ones that we show how those math operations can also be implemented in neurons, um, then we can go build stuff up. So that's one part of our approach. Another big thing that we've done is, well, if you've got this sort of complicated sort of sequential tasks and things like that, um, one sort of standard technique that's in the sort of the non-computational neuroscience field, but if people are just modeling complex tasks, they'll do things like called production systems, which are big sets of if-then rules. Um, we can't perfectly, you know, we can't do an ideal production system because of exactly what I was saying before, if we don't have perfect if statements. Um, but it turns out that if you take do something a lot like that, it's a little bit fuzzier, um, that, but that is doing something like, here's a bunch of different actions I could do right now, which one's the best action to do, let's do that one. Um, you end up with something that looks an awful lot like the basal ganglia. Um, that's a whole lecture in and of itself, um, but that's sort of just a feel for how we will end up playing with things. Uh, we call that overall approach the semantic pointer architecture, um, and the video that's been playing in the top right is sort of the, the biggest example that we have of doing something complicated with that. Um, this is Spawn. This has two and a half million spiking neurons. Everything's done using exactly the techniques that I just talked about. We're visually presenting a sequence of, of uh, a pattern and we're saying what comes next and it's able to figure out what comes next by just using the sorts of techniques that I just talked about there. Um, and it was able to even also wait and only produce the answer when it was supposed to produce the answer. All of those sorts of things were done by neurons. Um, there's no external control happening anywhere else. It's also controlling that arm and deciding what, um, how much um, to contract each muscle. Um, all of those different things um, are being implemented all in this one model, all using the techniques that, we ju that I just talked about. Okay, where can you go for more information on that? Um, basically, there's a bunch of Nengo.ai links for the core stuff, the documentation, there's also a fairly um, well-populated online forum of people discussing things. Um, I have a set of videos um, just sort of covering what I just talked about, but in a little bit more detail and doing hands-on examples with each of them. Um, that sort of, you know, walks you all through, so through making sort of the Nengo code for some of these components. Um, so that'll help. Um, so that's, I think, about six hours of videos there. And then if you want longer sets of videos, there is the Nengo Summer School videos that we put together. Um, and there is also a summer school, a two-week summer school that we normally run. Uh, we didn't run it in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, instead, we made these videos. Um, um, and, but uh, the idea there is to spend two weeks um, applying these techniques to some particular problem. So that's uh, also a good set of resources. Um, these ex these more extensive videos also go through a lot more other examples of things you can do. All right, so there is the whirlwind overview of neural engineering. Um, and what I'm going to do next is try to do a, a video that's sort of a concrete example of building up something using the techniques that I just talked about. Um, and that'll also be sort of a live demonstration of how to use this Nengo thing. Great. Well, we will see you later. And thanks. Bye.